Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Philosophy Hour of Literary Tales. I'm your host, Paul Krauss, and in this episode, we're overviewing one of the most misunderstood philosophers of modern times, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche is one of the most misunderstood, misinterpreted, and generally vilified modern philosophers. Many people charge him with being a nihilist, and others claim him as a nihilist because they are self-proclaimed nihilists. This, however, is patently false. Nietzsche was an anti-nihilist and opposed to nihilism properly understood. The key to Nietzsche, which is the key to understanding the Nietzschean canon, is his idea of self-overcoming, that concept which produces his infamous Superman or the Overman. The basics of all Nietzschean philosophy rest on understanding what Nietzsche actually means by the philosophy of self-overcoming. The first general mistake in Nietzsche is that he was a nihilist because of misunderstood statements like man having killed God and that we needed to transcend simple morality of good and evil. On the contrary, Nietzsche thought that such ideas of well-defined good, well-defined evil, systems of morality, transcendental truth, and eternal happiness offered in union with the design were themselves nihilistic. Why? Because they misrepresented the only truth, the one truth, the only truth about life, which is self-overcoming. Nietzsche actually considered himself a humanist and someone who celebrated life in its essence, that essence of struggle. It was everyone else who had misunderstood the idea of life, that life is about peace or harmony or happiness. Nietzsche was influenced by the emerging evolutionary and biological science of the 19th century, as well as Friedrich Schelling's Natur Philosophie, his nature philosophy. For Nietzsche, the naturalistic materialist he was, all life ultimately sprang from this material, natural world. All life followed the basic biological impulses that were now being discovered in 19th century biology and vitalistic science. Life was not mechanical like the 17th and 18th century scientists and philosophers believed, the notion that man was a machine but that life was ultimately something chaotic, organic, and aimed at one specific thing, the attainment of more life through struggle. But we can never really get more life, just like we can't get more being. We simply are life, and life is struggle. So the task to say yes to life is to say yes to the very essence of life, and the essence of life is struggle. Therefore, to say yes to life is to say yes to struggle. And only in accepting the reality of struggle, rather than creating ideas of eternal happiness, or bliss, serenity, or harmony with nature, and so on and so forth, could life actually flourish. Nietzsche, having been born into a religiously Protestant, Lutheran family, had, as many know, a very paradoxical relationship with Christianity. But it is not one, as, cru as often crudely portrayed, that he simply hated Christianity. Every scholar of Nietzsche knows that that is really a misinterpretation or a misrepresentation of Nietzsche's views. They were far more complex than I just hate God and I hate Christianity. In his elaborate system, Nietzsche actually considered himself the prophet of life. He also considered himself, somewhat paradoxically, a true disciple of Jesus, 
insofar that the message of Jesus was about life. He also thought that the best form of Christianity, found in Catholicism rather than Protestantism, was his real enemy because Catholic Christianity was closer to the truth, but made a major mistake in saying that one could have happiness through union with the good, the true, the beautiful, i.e. God. Since the transcendent doesn't exist, people deceive themselves, according to Nietzsche, into thinking that they have achieved union with the good, the true, and the beautiful, thereby ceasing their struggle to overcome what Christianity called sin. Nietzsche, in this manner, thought that the best strand of Christianity, Catholicism, occupied the middle tier between the overman and the last man. Why? Because through Christianity's doctrine of original sin, sin had taken away life and thereby had to be struggled against. As one scholar says of Nietzsche, for Nietzsche, the saint is an archetype of the will to power, end quote. The will to power over sin, to transcend one's fallen nature to glorification into sainthood was something that Nietzsche saw as extremely positive. But the failure of Christianity, Catholicism, its idea of the saint, was that you could actually attain sainthood. While there was no God in the Christian understanding of God, saintliness and sin, this idea of struggling against sin and moving toward saintliness gave the Christian something to struggle against in order to say yes to life. But again, the mistake of Christianity, according to Nietzsche, was to think that union with God was possible, and this would produce the end of struggle, the end of self-overcoming, and therefore the end of life. Thus, according to Nietzsche, Christians are actually superior to liberals and communists because they are not infected by the hedonistic, consumeristic philosophy of the liberal and materialistic understanding of life that had emanated out of the so-called Enlightenment. For liberalism and communism ultimately rejects the idea of struggle and embraces the notion that all life simply wants material comfort and equality. This, according to Nietzsche, is hogwash, and at least Christianity understood some aspect of struggle, of self-overcoming, through its conception of sin and promotion of saintliness. Anyway, Nietzsche saw all of the philosophies prior to him as offering some form of contentment to life, and he ranked these in a various form of hierarchy based on how much struggle one would be willing to take before reaching contentment. At the bottom, he placed the bourgeois liberals and the communists, because ultimately their form of contentment with life was the pathetic materialism and comfort offered in wealth and equality. Higher up that pyramid are the various religions and other philosophies, for at least those ideas and those belief systems caused you to struggle, and that the contentment offered in life was something more than just matter and material security. So, from Nietzsche's perspective, he was not actually a nihilist, for he believed that there was a supreme value in life, and that value in life, that virtue, was struggle against the nothingness offered in contentment. Properly speaking, then, Nietzsche is actually an anti-nihilist. He is warning against the idea that you can simply live a life of catatonic comfort. He fancied himself a prophet of life, and in his prophecy of life, his prophecy of struggle, of self-overcoming, a future generation could become the overmen. 
Nietzsche also believed in a hierarchical and ordered cosmos. This hierarchical and ordered cosmos is the result of what biology and Darwinian science had concluded. Life situates itself on a hierarchy that is sorted out to sustain life and develop life through the process of evolutionary struggle. This is important in understanding Nietzsche because this is what allows the situating of people into the concept and category of the overman, the middleman, and the last man, so on and so forth, down through the pyramid. The overmen are at the top, the middlemen in the middle, and the last men at the bottom. This is why the age of nihilism, the current age we are living in, is both dangerous and exhilarating. For the first time since the inception of life itself, life has the opportunity to be what it is, power and overcoming. In the age of nihilism, with the loss of all values, civilization at the weakest it has ever been, now life has the opportunity to struggle to build something new, a new set of values, a new civilization to struggle to attain. But then here comes the paradox of Nietzsche. One must never be content with the attainment of the new creation of values or the new creation of civilization. This is why for Nietzsche, one must be perpetually engaged in the transvaluation of all values, in the constant overcoming of civilization's offer for comfort and security. One must always be willing to sacrifice and die. One must always be willing to struggle. But instead of constantly struggling to the point of death, people rather cower and hide, be nice to others, and so on. As Nietzsche writes, this is cowardice in the face of reality. The cowardice to live for oneself, or to defend oneself, or to be nice to others so that they may be nice to you, is a rejection of the reality of struggle. The loss of the sacred, the loss of the beauty, the beautiful, and the loss of a sense of belonging means that the true overmen of society now have the opportunity to become what they actually are, what they are destined to be, the superman. But the loss of all that used to provide comfort and security and meaning in life means that the struggle to become the overman is one of power, conflict, struggle. We must embrace the struggle of life in order to be the best of life. And this is why Christianity needs to self-exhaust itself, according to Nietzsche. For in its sacrality and its theology of beauty, we misdirect our will to defend what Nietzsche considers to be the abstract, culture, art, beauty, the church, etc., instead of being true to ourselves, our will, since humans are nothing more than pure will in Nietzsche's understanding of human nature. For it is our will that propels us forward in struggle and conflict to attain higher levels of life. And that is what self-overcoming is all about. But for Nietzsche, the insatiable desire to manifest power itself is what the drive of the will is all about. And that will lead us into the constant new creation, the reinvention of values, every single moment of our life. And that is the essence of so-called freedom, the freedom to say yes to life in creating the very ideals in which you will struggle for, but that you must also recognize that you will never actually attain. Or if you do attain it, then you must create a new image, a new ideal, a new set of values in which you can strive for 
and live by. The self must always embrace the possibility of self-overcoming. It must constantly embrace power and the struggle that power entails. Otherwise, it slips back into the comforts of material security, religion, or the world of ready-made values from which life ends and death begins. As Nietzsche writes in The Twilight of the Idols, one must need to be strong, otherwise one will never become strong. The strong understand that struggle itself is the greatest virtue and value in life. You must struggle, struggle, and struggle until you die. For that is what life is about. For if you do not struggle, you allow yourself to die. And that is the antithesis of life. Strength for Nietzsche represents our harmonization with the will that is also the universe itself. For the universe, the cosmos, is will. The will to life. The will to struggle. The will to overcome. This self-overcoming, this embrace of the entire notion of will, power, and struggle is what the overman is all about. The overman is not necessarily a physically superior person or a racially superior person or anything like that that has been misconstrued from Nietzsche's philosophy. The overman is the person who has realized his freedom to manifest power and struggle by becoming one with the will to power to become the self-overcoming self. Technically speaking, anyone can become an overman, but very few people actually will become an overman. The idea of the overman is really an internal metaphysical interior reality, not something physical or exterior. Anyone can embrace the will to struggle, regardless of how big they are, where they were born, what nationality, ethnicity, or race, or gender they are. For Nietzsche, our rank in the cosmic order of the universe is determined by our exertion of power. As he says in his aptly titled book, The Will to Power, what determines rank sets off rank is only quanta of power and nothing else. The overman reveals himself by his embrace of power and the exertion of that power, which is principally coming from the will and then exerted through the body. The more powerful you are, the freer you are, because the more powerful you are reflects the more committed you are to the philosophy of self-overcoming. There are different shades of freedom then. The least powerful are the least free because they lack the will to power. The most powerful are those who are most free. The most free because they have actualized the will to power in themselves to become the self-overcoming self. Nietzsche, therefore, envisions a hierarchical, aristocratic, and organic society as the healthy society for these reasons. Because when all people are in this will to struggle, by the fact of nature, that struggle to power, that struggle to self-overcome, will sort itself out within that pyramid and hierarchy that Nietzsche envisions. Those with the greatest will and therefore the greatest power will end up at the top. Those with a modest level of will and a modest level of self-drive and power will situate themselves in the middle. And those who lack the will to overcome, lack the will to power, lack the ability to exert themselves would rather just be last men taken care of by the organs of liberal and communist society. Give me food, give me bread, give me comfort, give me warmth, and I will be happy. 
Freedom, then, for Nietzsche, is the unlimited power that men must exert within the world in the process of self-overcoming. The moment you cease self-overcoming, you have reneged on your freedom. Freedom, then, is only ever a manifestation of the power of self-overcoming. All history has been leading up to this moment of the liberation of the will in the world so that the will and the self can be one and the same and self-overcoming, the will of self-drive and determination becomes freedom. Only the man who self-overcomes reflects the freedom that has been written into the very will of the universe which history has been working toward all along. But this is a constant and continuous process, the eternal recurrence that Nietzsche talks about. And by its continuous process of self-overcoming, self-drive, self-expression of freedom, the most free and healthy society continually plays out this reality within it at all times. In self-overcoming, man liberates himself, paradoxically, from himself and realizes his will as power manifested in the world, which grants him complete dominion over himself, but also over the world, which is his to realize greater and greater levels of freedom. And only the person who is constantly engaged in the task of self-overcoming is the man who is free because he has total power, which is what freedom ultimately is about. The will itself to will power into existence and to overcome. Self-overcoming represents the harmonization of self-overcoming with the will to power. If you want to think of it this way, Nietzsche's concept of self-overcoming, freedom, and the will to power are one and the same properly understood. The will to power is self-overcoming, self-overcoming is freedom, freedom is the will to power and self-overcoming. And it is only when one achieves this harmony of will power, self-overcoming, and freedom that one has embraced the reality of life. Behold, I am that which must overcome itself again and again, as Nietzsche famously proclaims. Life for Nietzsche, as you are beginning to understand, is nothing more and nothing less than the struggle for becoming, becoming freedom, which is to mean to become the will itself, to become struggle itself, to become self-overcoming itself. But you will never actually arrive at any moment of peace, serenity, or contentment. You are always constantly in a state of becoming, because becoming is freedom. And if you cease becoming freedom, you fall into comfort and security, which is slavery. Whatever I create, and however much I love it, soon I must oppose it, and my love, thus my will, wills it, Nietzsche famously says. says Whatever values you create for yourself, whatever virtue, whatever image that you are striving for, the moment you obtain it, Nietzsche says, you must then oppose it and destroy it. Otherwise, you will become a slave to it. My will wills it. It is not a choice I make. It has been predetermined for me because the world is the will to power. And if I cease the will to power, if I cease becoming, I cease my own freedom. Within all of this, we see Nietzsche's philosophy as one in which life is perpetual struggle. It is the perpetual struggle to be life, and there you can see how Nietzsche drew from Darwinian science, 
For Nietzsche, the problem of Enlightenment historicism is that in its materialism and consumerism embodied by the politics of liberalism and communism especially, we end up as essentially mindless zombies who only live for economic purposes, the economic purpose of comfort and security, wealth and equality. But this is not living according to Nietzsche. This is the very antithesis of what life is about. Nietzsche's critique of Hegel and why he viewed Hegel as a heretical Christian was because Hegel's end of history is also the grand union of art, philosophy, theology, culture, community, and law in harmony with itself, giving citizens the very meaning and sustenance of their life and the purpose of their existence. History is the progress of culture, but culture eventually leads to an ultimate form, and in its ultimate form, the end is achieved. Thus, in this outlook, according to Nietzsche, the triumph of culture envisioned by Hegel is paradoxically the end of culture at the same time, and we would no longer be struggling to create a new and better culture, and therefore we have embraced the very antithesis of what life was actually all about. And thus, from Nietzsche's perspective, even Hegel's end of history, which is the end of culture, is antithetical to life. This is why Nietzsche ultimately rejects the classical outlook, even though he saves the ancient poetic metaphysics of conflict, struggle, and power. Many people think that Nietzsche wanted a return to the ancient Greek world. This is, again, patently false. The want for beauty, happiness, and culture, and peace leads to the softening of life itself. The return to the glory of Greece or the glory of Rome is a false reality. Behold, I am that which must overcome itself again and again, Nietzsche proclaims. Why Nietzsche loved the ancient Greek world was because the pre-Socratic philosophers and poets like Hesiod and Homer promoted a world, a worldview, a metaphysic of struggle, of power, of war, of determination, of the will. That is what the ancient world got right, whereas the modern world is telling you comfort, security, peace, prosperity. Nietzsche rejects that. This world is the will to power, he says, and nothing besides. In fact, if you want to sum up Nietzsche's entire philosophy in a single sentence, that is it. This world is the will to power and nothing besides. And proper exertion of will represents the overman in the age of nihilism. And living in this age of nihilism, now is the moment when we realize that the world is nothing but the will to power, and once we embrace that, then we become freedom. Then we become the overman. Then we become what life is actually about. Thus, the heart of Nietzsche's philosophy is, as we've been saying, this idea of constant struggle, of constant self overcoming. For Nietzsche, his philosophy is true self-overcoming because we must constantly and always be in this state of struggle with ourselves and the world we live in, a struggle against falling into the temptations of comfort, security, and happiness because this would represent the end of struggle. According to Nietzsche's critique of Christianity, the problem with Christianity was it envisioned an eventual end of the overcoming of sin, which meant that Christianity would die. According to Nietzsche and his critique of liberalism, communism, and the modern philosophies of politics and of Hegel, 
the striving to achieve a world of perfect culture, of perfect equality, of perfect wealth, would all lead to a life of comfort and security and happiness, which would be the antithesis of what everything about our biology, our science, and history has shown. No, life is not about some magical form of happiness, however it is conceived. It is not about achieving some interior peace or exterior peace in the world. It's not about union with the good, the true, and the beautiful. It is not about comfort and security. It is not about justice. It is not about wealth. It is not about equality. It is simply about self overcoming. It's the exertion of the will to become freedom. And freedom is nothing more than overcoming. Struggle is life. Struggle is freedom. Struggle is power. And that is the true philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche.